Theorites, Tales of One Thousand and One Nights Volume 3 By Anonymous Author Audiobook 54x69 Our father brought us up until we had till we had reached manhood and, on his death, he left us a house and a shop filled with colored materials of all kinds from India, rum, and kurasan, as well as with other goods, together with sixty thousand dinars in cash. When he died, we washed his corpse, and made a magnificent tomb for him, where we buried him, entrusting him to the mercy of God. We arranged for prayers to be said for his soul and the Quran to be recited, and we gave alms in his name for a full forty days. At the end of this period, I gathered together the merchants and leading citizens and provided a lavish meal. When they had finished eating, I said, Merchants, this world is transitory while the next is eternal, glory be to God, who is everlasting, while his creatures pass away. Do you know why I have brought you together here on this blessed day? Praise be to God, they replied, for it is he who knows what is hidden from us. My father has died leaving behind a sum of money, I told them, and I am afraid that some of you may have claims on his estate through debts or pledges or something else. If there is anything that he owed to anyone, I want to clear the debt, and so if any of you is owed money, please tell me how much this is so that I can settle it on my father's behalf. ABD Allah, they told me, this world's goods are no substitute for the world to come. We are not fraudsters, all of us know how to distinguish right from wrong, we fear Almighty God and we do not defraud orphans. We know that your father, may God have mercy on him, never pressed anyone to return his money, while, for his part, he never allowed his own debts to go unpaid. We always used to hear him say how afraid he was of misappropriating other people's goods and he used to pray constantly. My God, in you is my trust and my hope. Do not allow me to die with unpaid debts. It came naturally to him to settle what he owed without being asked for it, while he would never press for the payment of what was owed him but would tell the debtor. Take your time. If the man were poor, he would freely cancel the debt and if he died, but was not poor, your father would say. God has forgiven him what he owed me. We can all testify to the fact that no one is owed anything. God bless you, I told them. I then turned to these brothers of mine and said. Brothers, our father owed no one anything and he has left us money, materials, a house, and a shop. Each of the three of us is entitled to a third of the total. Shall we agree not to divide it but to keep it all in common and eat and drink together, or shall we split up the materials and the money, each taking his share? They wanted to follow this second course. At this point, he turned to the dogs and said. Is that what happened, and they lowered their heads and looked down, as though to say yes. ABD Allah went on. I got the Qadi to send an official to oversee the division, and he divided up the money, the materials, and everything that our father had left. I got the house and the shop in exchange for part of my share in the money, and as we had all agreed, my brothers took their own shares from the money and the materials. I then opened up the shop with a stock of materials, to which I had added by using the money that had come to me together with the house and the shop, until the shop was full. There I sat buying and selling while my brothers bought materials, hired a ship and set out on a trading voyage to distant parts. May God aid them, I said, but as for me, my livelihood comes to me here, and no price can be set on a quiet life. I stayed like this for a whole year, enjoying prosperity and making large profits until I had acquired as much as our father had left to all three of us. Then one day I happened to be sitting in the shop wearing two furs, one sable and one of grey squirrel, as it was winter and the weather was very cold. While I was there, in came my brothers, each wearing no more than a ragged shirt, shivering, their lips white with cold. I was so distressed to see them in such a state. Morning now dawned and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. 
Then, when it was the 981st night, she continued. I have heard, O fortunate king, that Abd Allah ibn Fadil told the caliph. I was so distressed to see them shivering that I was almost out of my I was so distressed to see them shivering that I was almost out of my mind in my grief for them. I got up and embraced them, shedding tears for their plight, and then I handed one of them the sable and the other the squirrel fur. I took them to the baths and provided each of them with clothes suitable for a wealthy merchant, which they put on after they had washed. I then took them back home and, seeing that they were hungry, I produced a meal for them and we all ate together, while I humored them and consoled them. Abd Allah turned again to the dogs and they confirmed what he had said by lowering their heads and looking down. He continued. I then asked them what had happened and where their money had gone. They said. We sailed off to a city called Kufa, where we sold for ten dinars materials that had cost us half a dinar and for twenty dinars what had cost us a single dinar. We made a huge profit and then bought Persian silks for ten dinars apiece, each of which was worth forty in Basra. Next we went to a city called al Kark, where we traded at a great profit and acquired a large sum of money. They went on telling me about the places they had been to and the profits they had made until I said. Since you enjoyed such success, how is that I see you coming back here without a thing? Brother, they said, sighing, we were unlucky and traveling is a dangerous business. We collected our wealth and our goods and when we had loaded everything on board ship, we sailed off on a course for Basra. On the fourth day of our voyage, the sea became disturbed, foaming and frothing as the swollen waves dashed together with fiery sparks. We were at the mercy of the winds which drove our ship against the projecting spur of a mountain. It broke up and we were plunged into the water, losing all our goods in the sea. We struggled in the water for a day and a night until God sent us another ship, whose crew took us on board, and on this we sailed from place to place, begging what food we could get and enduring great hardship. We started to strip off our clothes and to sell them for food until we came near Basra. When we got there, we were consumed by regret, for had we been able to save what we had, we would have fetched riches to rival those of the king but this was what God had decreed. I told them. Don't be distressed, my brothers, for wealth is used to ransom lives and if a man is safe, he has made a profit. As God has decreed your safe return, this is all that could be wished for, since poverty and wealth are no more than shadowy fantasies. How well the poet has expressed it. If you have managed to save your head, wealth is no more than the clipping of a fingernail. I went on. Let us suppose that our father has just died today and that all the money that I now have is what he left us. I am happy to divide it equally with you. I then got the Qadi to send an official, and after I had brought him all that I had, he divided it between the three of us with each of us taking a third share. I then said. When a man stays at home, God blesses him by providing him with his daily bread. Each of you should open a shop and stay there to earn his living, for he is bound to get what is destined to come to him. I did my best to help them do this, filling their shops with merchandise, and I told them to buy and sell, while keeping their money to themselves and not spending any of it. All that they might need in the way of food, drink, and so on, I promised to supply for them. I continued way of food, drink, and so on, I promised to supply for them. I continued to treat them generously, not allowing them to use any of their own money, and they would conduct their business by day before returning in the evening to spend the night in my house. Whenever I sat talking with them, they would start to sing the praises of foreign travel, reciting its advantages and describing the profits they had made, in the hope of inducing me to join with them in an expedition abroad. Here Abd Allah again asked the dogs whether this was true, and again they confirmed it by lowering their heads and looking down. He went on. They kept on trying to persuade me, 
telling me of the great profits that could be made in foreign parts and insisting that I should accompany them, until eventually, in order to please them, I said that I would go. We agreed to a partnership and hired a ship, which we loaded with all kinds of precious materials and trade goods of various sorts, as well as everything else that we might need. We put out from Basra, heading for the open sea with its boisterous waves, which brings destruction on all who set out upon it, while those who emerge from it are naked as newborn children. Our voyage took us on to a city where we traded profitably and from where we sailed on to another. We continued to go from place to place and from city to city, doing good business, until we had accumulated a very large sum of money and made a handsome profit. Eventually our captain dropped anchor by a mountain and told his passengers that, by way of relaxation, they could go ashore for the day in the hope of finding water. Everyone disembarked, including me, and each of us went off on his own to look for water. I started to climb the mountain, and on my way I caught sight of a white snake that was fleeing with a deformed and terrifying looking black snake in pursuit. The black snake caught up with the white one and pressed against it, seizing it by the head and wrapping its tail around the tail of its victim. The white snake cried out and I realized that it was about to be raped. Feeling sorry for it, I took up a lump of flint, weighing five or more rattles, and with this I struck the black snake and crushed its head. Then, before I knew what was happening, the white snake turned into a perfectly formed and lovely young girl, like a gleaming moon. She came up to me, kissed my hand and said, May God grant you double shelter, shelter from shame in this world and from hell fire in the world to come on the day of judgment, a day when a man who comes to God will not be helped by wealth or children, but only by an innocent heart. Asterisk she went on. Mortal, you have saved my honor and done me a service for which I must reward you. She then pointed at the ground, which opened for her and when she had gone down into it, it closed over her again, making me realize that she must be one of the jinn. As for the black snake, fire spread through its corpse and burned it to ashes. I was astonished by this and when I got back to my companions, I told them what I had seen. We spent the night there and the next morning the captain weighed anchor, hoisted the sails and had the ropes coiled. We sailed off until we were out of sight of land, and we went on for another twenty days, during which we saw no land and no birds. Then the captain told us that our stock of fresh water was exhausted and when we suggested landing to look for more, he said. By God, I have strayed from my course and I don't know how to get to land. We shed tears of distress, praying that Almighty God might send us guidance and passing an unhappy night. How well was this expressed by the poet? How many a night of misery did I spend, such as would whiten the hairs of a suckling child, but as soon as morning dawned, there came help from on high and speedy victory. When dawn broke and the light spread, we were overjoyed to see a lofty mountain, and when we reached it the captain told us to go ashore to look for water. We all landed and began to search but were saddened when we failed to find any water at all. At that point, I climbed to the top of the mountain and on its far side I caught sight of a rounded depression an hour's journey away or more. I called up my companions and, when they came, I pointed it out to them and said, I can see a lofty and strongly built city there, with walls and towers, there are hills and meadows and it is bound to have water and other good things. Let us go there to fetch water and to buy what we need by way of provisions, including meat and fruit, before we go back to the ship. The others said that they were afraid, pointing out. The people there may be enemies of religion, infidel polytheists, who will seize us and hold us prisoner, or else kill us, in which case we shall be responsible for our own deaths, having brought this on ourselves. Whoever is deceived into risking disaster wins no thanks, as the poet has said. As long as the earth and sky remain the same, the risk-taker is not praised, even if he escapes unhurt. We are not going to endanger ourselves. 
I've no authority over you, I told them, but I shall take my brothers and go off there. But even my told them, but I shall take my brothers and go off there. But even my brothers refused to come, saying that they were afraid, and so I said. For my own part, I have made up my mind to go, trusting in God and content with the fate he allots me. I told my brothers to wait until I came back from the city. Morning now dawned and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. Then, when it was the 982nd night, she continued. I have heard, O fortunate king, that Abd Allah ibn Fatil said. I told my brothers to wait for me to come back from the city, and then I left them and walked to the city gate. The city itself I discovered to be strangely designed and remarkably built, with high walls, strong towers, and lofty palaces. Its gates were made of Chinese iron, embellished and engraved in an astonishing fashion. When I entered the gate, I saw a stone bench on which a man was sitting with a brass chain wrapped round his arm from which fourteen keys were dangling. I realized that this must be the gatekeeper and that the city must have fourteen gates. So I went up and greeted him, but he did not return my greeting, and although I repeated it a second and a third time, he still made no reply. I put my hand on his shoulder and said. Why don't you answer my greeting? Are you asleep or deaf, or is it because you are not a Muslim? When he still gave no answer and stayed motionless, I looked more carefully and discovered that he was made of stone. How remarkable it is, I told myself, that this stone has been carved into so perfect a likeness of a man that all that it lacks is the power of speech. I left him and went into the city where I saw someone standing on the road, but when I went up and looked more closely, I found that he too was made of stone. After that, as I walked through the streets, I would go up and stare at the people whom I came across, but they all turned out to be stone. There was an old woman carrying on her head a bundle of clothes to be washed, and here again, when I looked at her from close at hand, both she and her bundle of clothes turned out to be stone. In the market I came across an oil seller with his scales set up and various types of goods, such as cheeses and so forth, there in front of him, all of stone. The other tradesmen were seated in their shops, while elsewhere some people were standing and others sitting. I saw stone men, women, and children, and when I got to the merchant's market, everything that I saw including the seated merchants and the goods that filled their shops was stone, while their fabrics were as insubstantial as spiders' webs. I started to look at them, but whenever I touched a robe, it crumbled to dust in my hands. I opened one of the chests that I found and in it were purses of gold. The purses themselves disintegrated at my touch but the gold was unchanged. I carried off as much as I could, saying to myself. If only my brothers had been with me, they could have taken as much of this as they needed and they could have helped themselves to these ownerless treasures. I went into another shop, where there was even more, but as I couldn't carry anything else, I left and went on from market to market looking at all kinds of stone creatures, including dogs and cats. When I got to the goldsmith's market, I saw men sitting in their shops holding some of their wares in their hands, while other pieces were in baskets. At the sight of this, I threw away my gold and took as many of these as I could carry. From there I passed on to the jeweler's market and saw the carry. From there I passed on to the jeweler's market and saw the owners sitting in their shops, each with a basket of precious stones in front of him, containing sapphires, diamonds, emeralds, ballast rubies and other gems. As the jewelers themselves were all of stone, I threw away the ornaments and picked up as many gems as I could carry, still regretting the fact that my brothers were not there to take what they could. After leaving the jewelers' market, I passed a huge door, finely decorated and most elegantly ornamented. Inside it were benches on which sat eunuchs, soldiers, guards, and officials, all splendidly dressed and all of stone. 
I touched one of them and the clothes that he was wearing melted from his body like a spider's web. I went through the door and discovered a palace unequaled in the splendor of its architecture and workmanship, its council chamber filled with men of rank, viziers, leading citizens, and emirs, seated on chairs and all of stone. On a golden chair, studded with pearls and other gems, a man was sitting, splendidly dressed and wearing an imperial crown set with precious jewels that shone as brightly as the day, and when I went up to look at him, he too was of stone. From there I went to the door of the women's quarters and, on entering, I found their audience chamber, where there was another chair of red gold studded with pearls and other gems. On this sat a queen with a crown set with precious gems, and on chairs around her sat women beautiful as moons wearing the most magnificent of colored robes, while to serve them eunuchs were standing with their arms crossed over their breasts. The room itself would dazzle all who looked at it with its decorations, its remarkable paintings and its sumptuous furnishings. Hanging there were magnificent lamps of pure crystal, and in every crystal globe was a unique jewel lamps of pure crystal, and in every crystal globe was a unique jewel beyond all price. I threw away what I was carrying and started to collect as many of these gems as I could carry. I didn't know what to take and what to leave, since what I saw there looked like a city's treasure house but then I caught sight of a little door that was standing open, leading to a flight of stairs. I went through and climbed up forty steps and then I heard someone reciting the Koran in a melodious voice. I walked in the direction of the voice and found myself at the door of a room where there was a silk curtain worked with threads of gold, set with pearls, coral, sapphires and emeralds, all gleaming like stars. The voice was coming from the far side of the curtain and so I went up and lifted it, to discover a door ornamented with bewildering beauty. Then, when I went in, I found what looked like a version of a talismanic treasure chamber set on the surface of the earth. Inside was a girl like a sun shining in a clear sky, dressed in the most splendid of robes and decked out with the richest of jewels. She was lovely, shapely, and perfect in her elegance with a slender waist and heavy buttocks. Her saliva could cure the sick, her eyelids drooped languorously, and it was as though it was to her that the poet was referring in his lines. I greet the figure that the robes enclose, with roses in the gardens of her cheeks. The Pleiades seem fixed upon her brow, with other stars a necklace on her breast. Were she to wear a rosebud dress, the rose leaves would draw blood from her soft flesh and were she to spit once in the salt sea, the sea would all be honey sweet. The sea would all be honey sweet. Were an old man, leaning on a staff, to lie with her, old as he was, he would hunt lions down. At the sight of this girl, I fell in love. I went up to her and found that she was seated on a high dais, reciting the Book of God, the Great and Glorious, from memory and her voice was like the sound made by the gates of paradise when opened by Ridwan. The words came from her lips like scattered jewels, while her lovely face was radiant and blooming, fitting the poet's description. Your words and qualities bring me delight, enhancing the desire and longing that I feel. You have two qualities that melt the lover's heart, David's melodiousness and Joseph's face. When I heard her melodious recitation, my heart, slain by her glance, stammered the words of the Koran. Peace, a saying of the compassionate Lord Asterisk I looked and was so bemused that I could not greet her properly, for I was as the poet has described. Longing confused me so I could not speak, the entrance to her sanctuary cost me my life. I only listened to the critic's words in order to call on her to be my witness. I then nerved myself to endure love's terrors and said, Peace be upon you, guarded lady and sheltered pearl. May God preserve the foundations of your prosperity and exalt the pillars of your glory. She replied, Peace, greeting and honor be on you, Abd Allah ibn Fadil. I replied, Peace, greeting and honor be on you, Abd Allah ibn Fadil. I welcome you, my darling and the delight of my eye.
How did you know my name? I asked her. Who are you and how is that that all the people in this city have been turned to stone? Please tell me what has happened, for what amazes me about the city and its inhabitants is that you are the only living creature here. For God's sake, tell me the truth about this. She said. Sit down, ABD Ella, and, God willing, I shall tell you all about myself and about this city and its people. There is no might and no power except with God, the Exalted, the Omnipotent. I took a seat by her side, and she went on. You must know, ABD Ella, that I am the daughter of the king of this city and it was my father whom you saw sitting on the high throne in the council chamber, surrounded by his officers of state and the leading men of his kingdom. He was a man of great power with an army of 1,120,000 men. He had 24,000 emirs, all of whom were governors holding state offices, and he ruled over a thousand cities, not to mention towns, estates, fortresses, citadels, and villages. A thousand Bedouin emirs owed him allegiance, each of whom commanded 20,000 riders, while his money, treasures, Precious stones and jewels were such as had never been seen or heard of before. Morning now dawned and Shahrazad broke off from what she had been allowed to say. Then, when it was the 983rd night, she continued. I have heard, O fortunate king, that the daughter of the king of the city of stones told Abd Allah. My father had wealth and treasures such as had never been seen or heard of before. On the battlefield he was a conqueror of kings and a destroyer of brave heroes, feared by tyrants and a subduer of emperors. For all that, however, he was an unbeliever, a polytheist who worshipped idols rather than the true Lord, as did all his men. One day he was seated on his throne surrounded by his grandees, when suddenly in came a man, the radiance of whose face illumined the council chamber. My father looked at him and saw that he was dressed in green, as well as being tall, with hands that hung down below his knees, his dignity was awe-inspiring and light shone from his face. False oppressor, he said to my father, how long will you deceive yourself with your idolatry and neglect to worship the omniscient king? Say. I bear witness that there is no god but God and that Muhammad is his servant and his messenger. Accept Islam, both you and your people, and abandon your worship of idols, which can do you no good and cannot intercede for you. The only true object of worship is God, who raised up the heavens without pillars and unfolded earth and sea out of pity for his servants. My father said. Who are you, who rejects the worship of idols and dares to speak as you have done? Are you not afraid that the idols may be angry with you? The idols are stones, the man replied. Their anger cannot hurt me, nor would their approval help me. Bring out the idol whom you worship and tell every one of your people to bring his own. When you have them all here, call on them to show their anger against me, while I call on my Lord to show his anger against them, and then you will see the difference between the wrath of the Creator and that of the created. You yourselves fashioned your idols, and devils then entered into them. It is these devils who speak to you from within them, the idols themselves are things that have been made, while my God is the Maker, the Omnipotent. If you can see what is true, follow it, and abandon what you see to be false. The people said. Bring a proof of your Lord for us to see, to which he replied. Bring me proofs of your own gods. My father gave orders that everyone who had an idol that he worshipped was to fetch it, and all these were then brought into the council chamber. So much for them, but as for me, I was sitting behind a curtain, looking down at my father's council chamber. I had an idol of my own, man-sized, and made of green emerald. When my father asked for it, I sent it to him and it was placed beside his own one, which was made of sapphire. The vizier's idol was made of diamonds, while as for those belonging to the army officers and others, some were of hyacinth gems, others of carnelian, coral, 
aloes wood or ebony. There were a number of silver idols, together with others of gold. Everyone had whatever he could afford, while as for the common soldiers and the citizens, some of theirs were of flint and others of wood, pottery, or clay, and they were all of different colors yellow, red, green, black or white. The stranger said to my father, Call on your idol and on these others to show their anger against me. So they arranged them in the form of a court, with my father's idol placed on a golden throne, with mine by its side at the head of the room, while all the others were set out in order of precedence, according to the rank of their worshipper. My father began to prostrate himself to his idol, saying, My God, you are the gracious Lord and among the idols none is greater than you. You know that this man has come here to attack your divinity and to mock you, claiming that he has a God who is stronger than you and telling us to abandon your service for that of this God of his. My God, show your anger against him. He kept on imploring his idol, but the idol made no reply and when it did not speak, he said. My God, this is not your custom. When I spoke to you, you used to reply to me so why do you now stay silent and say nothing? Are you not paying attention or are you asleep? Rouse up! Help me and speak to me! He shook it, but it still neither spoke nor moved from its place, and the stranger said to my father, Why is it saying nothing? He replied, I think that it cannot be paying attention or else is sleeping. Enemy of God, said the stranger, how can you worship a God who cannot speak and who has no power, in place of one who is at hand to answer prayer and is never absent, heedless, or asleep? He cannot be grasped by the imagination of men, he sees but is not seen and he has power over all things. Your God cannot protect itself from harm and within it lurks an accursed devil who misleads and deceives you. This devil has now left, so worship the true God and acknowledge that there is no other God who deserves your veneration and your service but Him, and He is the only good. As for this God of yours, as He cannot even protect Himself, how can He protect you? Look and see with your own eyes how powerless He is. He then went up to the idol and started to strike it on the neck until it fell to the ground. My father was angry and called out to those who were there. This unbeliever has struck my God. Kill him. They wanted to rise and strike him, but not one of them was able to move from his place. The stranger then offered them conversion to Islam, but they refused, at which he said, I shall show you the anger of my God. Show us, then, they said, and he spread out his hands and called, My Lord and God, in you is my trust and my hope. Answer my prayer and curse these evildoers who accept the good things you give them but worship other gods. I pray you, who are the mighty truth, the creator of night and day, to turn them into stone, for nothing is beyond your power as you are the omnipotent. At that, God turned everyone in the city to stone. As for me, when I saw the proof that the stranger brought, I surrendered myself to God and was saved from the fate of the others. The stranger came up to me and said, Your good fortune has been preordained by God in accordance with his will. He started to teach me, and I gave him my faithful pledge. I was seven years old at the time and I am now thirty. I said to the stranger, Sir, thanks to your pious prayer, everything in this city and all its people have been turned to stone while I have been saved because I was converted to Islam at your hands and you are my sheikh. Tell me your name, help me and provide me with food to eat. He told me that his name was Abu El Abbas al Qadr, and with his own hand he planted a pomegranate tree for me. It grew large, sprouted leaves, flowered and instantly produced a single pomegranate. al Qadr said, Eat what God has provided for you and give him the worship that is his due. He then taught me about Islam and instructed me how to pray and how to worship God, as well as teaching me how to recite the Quran. Audiobook generated by, 
read with the ears.